Josefina, you grew up in Romania? Yes. And so uh, off camera you were telling me some interesting things about just movie going in general uh, during the time you were there. It's a lot to talk about it, but uh, I can, you know, I can tell you it was just, you know, it was censorship going on, a lot of censorship. So obviously I didn't grow up with a lot of uh, Hollywood movies that they were modern. Basically, I was watching a lot of Romanian movies that were made in Romania or other uh, communist made movies. Uh, also, more like Hollywood movies from the 40s, musicals and dramas and things like that. But not a lot of mainstream mu uh, movies uh, like, you know, Rocky or John Hughes movies or things like that that I had to, you know, catch up with after I moved here. And also no horror movies because those were forbidden during uh, communism because the dictator that we had didn't want to be compared to one of the, you know, monsters like Dracula or Frankenstein from the horror movies, but of course people still compared him with that. So that's why he uh, banned all the horror movies at the time. So once again, it's kind of strange because I'm making horror movies, but I didn't grow up with them. Well, obviously I had a lot of catching up to do after I moved here and started to work in the industry. Was that one of the first things that you did once you were able to watch horror films or no, it just kind of was a natural? It was a natural process. It's kind of, it was kind of overwhelming because we're going from one video store to the another and they're like all these movies that I wanted to watch for, you know, a long time. So I would watch almost everything. Like we always watch a movie a, a day, but obviously I wanted to catch up on horror movies because my husband was making horror movies. So I wanted to, you know, understand more of the genre. And then also I started to work um, on various independent productions in the horror movies. And you work with people who have uh, interesting careers and resumes. So you want to watch their movies before you interview for a job or once you start working with them because I think it's normal to be able to have a better conversation with them and learn from them uh, because they always give you examples So what I did on this movie or that movie but I think you should watch their you know, work first. So, um, and then, you know, more you... Uh, you dig into that. I think it's an interesting genre and it's uh, very widespread and um, for me I'm like at a level when I think I, I love digging into like it's not just about um, I have to do that. It's something that I enjoy and uh, I like to uh, go more into obscure things and it's a lot of learn learning to do because I think you should know a lot about the genre that you are making movies uh, in. And uh, for me, it's a very interesting, it's been a very interesting process because it opened me up to different possibilities. Sometimes people put um, horror filmmaking kind of like almost like in the ghetto of filmmaking. And I think that's wrong because if you look at various uh, filmmakers or movies, um, you can express a lot of interesting ideas through horror movies. You can be political or what's going on in the society at that point. Sure, you might do it with zombies or vampires or whatever, but you can do interesting things and also explore the human nature. And for me, you know, with horror movies, you can do that definitely. Because what I think is interesting sometimes, it's not necessarily about, um, sometimes scary for me, it's not necessarily monsters or vampires. That could be it. But it's more how we, how human beings treat each other. And that's something that I like to explore in horror movies because sometimes that can get very scary. Sure. And people's hidden agendas and ulterior motives. Absolutely. Absolutely. That can be, uh, for me, more frightening than, you know, fighting with a monster. Sure. So when you would go to the cinema, when you were in Romania, mm -hmm. uh, what was that experience like in terms of the audience? watching the film and engaging with it? You know, people loved movies. Um, they were so thirsty for that. And um, I remember being in lines, especially if it was an American movie, because sometimes they would have, like, let's say, Kramer versus Kramer or something a bit more innocent. They would show that. Well, there were lines around the theater. And once you, if you're lucky to get a ticket, let's say later that afternoon or something, the theaters were full. So people, it was a lot of, uh, love for movies and going to the movies. And also I grew up um, 
with an uncle who was a director of photography. So from an early age, I was either you know in front of the camera, behind the camera, in different situations, and I learned a lot and also watched a lot from shorts to anything I could you know see. It was possible for me to see during that time period. And also later on, it was also something interesting. Once the VHS era started, we were having uh, pirated, you know, um, VHS uh, tapes. They were like, literally, it was kind of like almost like a hidden circuit. And they were dubbed by a Romanian translator who became a famous film critic nowadays. It's even a documentary made about that era and how she was dubbing movies and about this underground um, circuit. And, you know, you could, everybody was just like so eager to watch anything that it was kind of, it's a fascinating era, you know, basically because something gets banned. What happens, people become more thirsty for whatever that's forbidden. So people keep trying to find, and they find ways to see it, you know? I mean, I watched, I remember, I think it's this Meryl Streep movie, Falling in Love, totally dubbed by this <laughs> lady, like the voice, everybody was speaking with the same uh, voice, but you know what? I didn't care, you know? If a movie transports you into another world, it's gonna happen no matter what. And it was on PAL? Like the, the... It was on PAL, yeah. Basically, I don't know, it was literally, Somebody from, you know, KGB, like in Russia, we had our own KGB. And what's strange, somebody from who was an officer in that KGB had like a little operation that was bringing tapes from the West and had a little studio. And uh, he was making, transferring, you know, in PAL and have hired this lady to translate and dub them. Basically, she didn't even have time to watch the movie. She would just show up at the studio put her, you know, headphones on and she just start translated right then and there. So, you know, obviously it's not like the best transla translation. She was just doing the best she could because there was like so much demand that she couldn't, you know, watch the movie, take notes, translate, all that. She was just doing it like almost on the spot. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And we were watching these tapes and everybody was making dub from a dub and you watch Aliens at some, you know, some friend of <laughs> yours birthday party like that. And, you know, everybody was, you know, it's not like an underground, like, okay, I'm giving you Aliens, but don't tell that to anybody. Okay. And, you know, from then on, some people are making dubs and it was growing. But, you know, obviously in the theaters, uh, people were lining up and I mean, I watched, you know, sometimes a weird double feature, some Western from the 60s or some Italian cop movie from the 70s. You know, you never know. And for me, it's kind of, it's how I grew up. So how does that affect how you make movies now, knowing that if you try to either conceal something or prevent people from seeing it, it's only going to make them want to see it more? I mean, I guess that's just human nature. It is human nature. Well, you know what happened for us um, with um, our last two movies, High 8 and High Def, is we have different filmmakers who live and work in different parts of the U.S. creating a segment for these hard anthologies. And one of the main things we wanted um, to um, create with this was give everybody the creative freedom. Because people think of uh, independent filmmaking in the US and they think of Sundance or they think of whatever they think, not a whole lot. But probably what they think about is more that they have, in the, they have creative freedom. And that's not the case. We've been make, making movies uh, as independents for like uh, over 10 years now. And sometimes you just kind of do whatever your investor tells you to do, or you try to work with them. You come up with an idea, but you kind of have to put some actress in it that you don't want, or make a zombie movie, but you have creative freedom, but you know, you kind of start with their concept. So it's not so much creative freedom for independent filmmakers all the time. And we know that. And other filmmakers who work in the United States, they know that. They've dealt with all sorts of interesting situations. And we realized that. We're like, well, let's create something that these uh, filmmakers can do what they really want to do. 
We're not going to get involved in their scripts, in their ideas. We're not going to tell them what to do. Uh, we have some rules that everybody have to respect more like a, on a technical level or just, you know, uh, to have more like an interesting dogma style um, approach, but they're going to have creative freedom. So that's what we're trying to do. And that's something that I think I'm kind of obsessed with because I'm from Europe. I'm more about um, filmmakers being, especially directors, being an auteur because I've seen how much interference there is in the U.S. and how many directors sometimes they um, are cut off from editing room and, you know, I've heard and witnessed <laughs> all sorts of situations. So I think it's important to give the directors their voice. And that's something that I probably carry too from living, you know, under communism and censorship for, you know, 13, 14 years of my life, yeah.